co-host of PID Radio, author of several books, molecular biologist. She was on her way to study the eye, and Derek Gilbert came in, ruined all that for her. But we have her here today, and I am so excited and so honored to uh, present Sharon Gilbert to you. Thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you. It is such an honor to stand up here. And I want to say before I forget, Jeff Rott, where are you? Sir, you are right on. You are right on. And I want to thank the Lord for inspiring you to give the presentation you did today. Amen. It's been an interesting week for us. We encountered printer problem after printer problem to get our presentations printed out. The first printer literally blew up. It was ugly. The second printer ran out of ink after printing about 60 pages. So Derek is sitting down there without a copy of this talk and I'm going to be telling him when to advance the slide. So <laughs> we'll be doing our mental telepathy thing. <clears throat> Forgive me because I, I am not one of those people who can just stand up even though I, I like to talk. Uh, I find it easier for me because I am honestly, I have trouble remembering things sometimes. If you've listened to our show, you know that I will sit there and go, I can't think of the word, I can't. Well, because of that, I wrote it all out. So all I have to do is read it. And I'm praying to the Lord that everything that I have written out is in accordance with what he wants presented here today. Originally, I had planned on giving you the basics. These are reading glasses, so I have to take them off when I look at you. Otherwise, you're all fuzzy. I, I had originally <coughs> planned on using that whiteboard over there and giving you the basics of DNA recombination and how transhumanism is definitely going on. The Lord told me that's not exactly what he wanted me to present today, although I am going to talk about DNA. I am standing here, here today not as a geneticist, but as a genesisist. <laughs> he drove me to the very first few chapters, the first few verses of the Bible that we hold so near and dear. So without further ado, there's an old joke that goes something like this. One day, a group of scientists got together and decided that man had come a long way and no longer needed God. So they picked one scientist to go and tell God that they were finished with him. The scientist walked up to God and said, God, we've decided that we no longer need you. We're to the point that we can clone people and do many miraculous things. So why don't you just go away and get lost? Well, God listened very patiently and kindly to the man, and after the scientist was done talking, God said, Oh, very well. <clears throat> How about this? Let's have a man-making contest. To which the scientist replied very happily, Oh, great, we'll do that. But God added, Now, <clears throat> we're going to do this just like I did back in the old days with Adam. The scientist said, sure, no problem, we can do that. And he bent down and grabbed himself a handful of dirt. God just looked at him and smiled. Oh, no, 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 no. You go get your own dirt. <laughs> Gary Larson is one of my favorite cartoonists. He had a twisted knack for encapsulating thought within one scene. His humor often made me laugh as much as it made me think. The cartoon shown in this slide, God Makes the Snake, is creating it out of already existing clay. It's tantamount to what scientists are doing today, though they would be loath to admit it. Cloning, gene therapy, even DNA mutagenesis 
are ultimately using and altering God's dirt. True creation, making something from nothing, ceased to exist when God decided to rest. Scientists, however, would never admit that they cannot achieve true innovation because in their minds, God's dirt is nothing more than the current state of creation. Therefore, altering the current design is tantamount to creating a new thing. As such, it might be said that today's genetic scientists are in a race to create their own dirt. Strangely enough, though, their own dirt is nothing more than a pitiful copy of God's original design. If you've never heard of recursion, don't despair. It's one of those words that scientists keep in their arsenal for papers and presentations like this one. Truthfully, I had to even look it up to make sure I understood it correctly. Recursion, according to Wikipedia, is a method of defining functions in which the function being defined is applied within its own definition. Specifically, it is defining an infinite statement using finite components. If you're puzzling over this definition, don't despair. The circular logic required will give you a splitting headache. Let's just say that it boils down to creating A by using A. To quote Winston Churchill, it is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. <laughs> if one carried recursion to its ultimate end, there would be none. Recursion takes you into infinity. You can see by that slide, which curiously forms a pyramid. And I mentioned before, true innovation for this time period at least ceased on sunset of day six when God finished his work and declared, it is good. With his creation in place, the Lord God put up his feet and decided to sit back and enjoy the beautiful universe that he'd made. Creation and cosmological firsts ceased to be, at least in the limited imaginations of mankind as we can picture it. However, even if you and I cannot imagine anything truly new, I believe, that the Lord has many more ontological tricks up his sleeve. I also believe that innovation will recommence at a not too distant date, say in about a thousand years, with the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. But during the next hour or so, I want to explore modern <coughs> science's attempts to unseat God, to ascend to the uttermost north and take the throne as creator. To achieve this, science must first make God out to be a liar. So before we examine the claims of science, let's take a look at God's own blog, as recorded by Moses. <laughs> For those of you with a Bible, I'm going to be talking about the familiar account found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void and without form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Here we find the prologue to God's creation story. It tells us of a world left form, void and without form. It is the quintessential dark and stormy night. <laughs> Let's examine a few of the elements. Day one, we have darkness. It's a precondition or perhaps an entity that pre-exists the creation of what we know as our world. In Genesis 1-2, we see, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Note here that the original Hebrew for darkness is chosek, which means a dark place, or it can mean an underground prison, and that the word deep comes from the Hebrew word tehom, which means, well, it can mean deep, but it also can mean abyss. Curious. If some believe Genesis 1-1 hints at a pre-Adamic first creation account, 
then this darkness, and I use a capital D there, might refer to creatures or a creature beneath the waters, imprisoned following a battle on an earlier version of our 